automatically going. Good morning, Beulah Church. It's good to see you this morning, and it's so good to hear the chatter, the excitement in your voices and being in the house of the Lord. It sounds to me like summer is here. Amen? You all are excited about a wonderful, beautiful day to be gathered in the house of the Lord. How many of you are thankful today that we can gather in this space? Anybody thankful? Amen. It's a good thing to gather together and worship. Psalm 92 invites us. With these words, I invite you now to hear this word of encouragement. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every single night. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your works. I will triumph in the works of your hand. How many of this morning feel like triumphing in the works of the, the, the hand of the Lord? Amen. God is good. I will praise you, praising your name almost time, declaring your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every single night. This morning we've come to declare the loving kindness of God. I pray that you've encountered that loving kindness this morning. At the end of this day, we're going to say, God, again, you have been faithful. Amen. Again, God, you have been faithful. So we look forward to a blessed day because we have a wonderful, wonderful God. I want to invite you to know this morning that as a church, we are disciples of Christ called to serve, to worship, to be engaged one with another and in the world around us. And so a couple of announcements I want to share with you this morning as you're settling in, preparing yourself to sing praises to the Lord this morning. A couple of important announcements. How many of you know that we have a community garden? A community garden that's being created on our property. This community garden is an incredible blessing. If you have opportunity today and would like to go down to the soccer field, if you don't know where that is, we can point you in that direction. We have beautiful garden beds built out of cedar that will last a long time. And they are filled with beautiful soil and now plants. Five to six of those beds have been spoken for by families in our community and church. So if you're interested in a community garden bed, I would say you should let us know this morning because they are going quickly. The idea is that gives us a space, a, a neutral space to have, uh, invite our community, our neighbors and church family into this space to share uh, spots together, to grow plants together, to have conversation together, to encourage one another. And hopefully by the end of the summer, when our Wednesday evening meals begin to pick up again, we'll have fresh produce to share from those gardens to make fresh salsa Wednesday evenings and, and onions for hamburgers that we'll serve. So we're excited about the full scope of that ministry. So if you're interested in the community garden, maybe just to see them. Uh, and uh, the invitation is there for you to do that, to walk down to the soccer field. Uh, that does not uh, cause a problem for our soccer ministry. That space is huge and it also can support community gardens. Many of you have asked me, well, what about the soccer ministry? It's, it's well, it's good. Uh, so there won't be any problem in shared space. So if you want to see the community garden or claim a bed, please let me or Gabe or John know, Pastor John, this morning or sometime early this week. Wednesday evening Bible study. We have ordered, I believe, more than 115 books now. We may be inching on up to around 125 books. 
that we're using for our uh, discipleship series on Wednesday evening. It's called by Susan Robb, but we're also in introducing this as a Sunday school curriculum for the classes that are meeting now. Some of you have gotten books even this week. So if you have not yet picked up a book and you want to be involved in our Wednesday evening, seven o'clock Facebook discipleship study, or your Sunday school class is now meeting, or you want to be involved in a Sunday school class and would like a book, please let us know. It's not too late to order these books. It's exciting. I was I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. I remember when arriving at Beulah more than four years ago, we tried a book study. And we ordered 10 books. Six were picked up and four were left in the office. We're now ordering 115, 125, 130 books for book study. So that's exciting to know that we're hungry to be in discipleship study together. We're growing together and we're growing in God's word. So if you haven't gotten a book and you're interested, please let us know. We can get a book to you this week. Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock via Facebook. You can log on to the Beulah Facebook page and find uh, a guide for the study there as well. Next Sunday morning, Sunday, June the 13th, we're going to recognize the graduates of our church. So if you have a graduating senior from high school, please invite that senior to be here. Uh, we're going to recognize those. If you have a college age student who will be receiving a scholarship from the church, we would invite you to be here as well. We're going to recognize those scholarship recipients. If you're graduating from college, we want to celebrate you as well. We have 10 students who applied for scholarships this year through the Buell Scholarship Fund, and we are awarding 10 students scholarships. Uh, we have a total of about $22,500 that we'll be distributing this year to our 10 students, so we look forward to seeing you next Sunday morning, students. And it's on Sunday evening at 5.30, correct, Pastor John? Right here on the breezeway of the church, we're going to have backyard worship where we recognize and celebrate those seniors and those graduates. So uh, backyard worship at 530, all are invited to participate. We'll have a worship service outside. Food, if you're interested in participating, please let Pastor John know because we have to order food to be shared outside. So next Sunday, we're gonna recognize our graduates and celebrate uh, good hard work for many, many years uh, and celebrate those by lifting them up in prayer and awarding scholarships. So next Sunday, it's a wonderful day of celebration. So those are three important announcements with the announcements of the work of the church before us and now announced and behind us. The invitation of the psalmist this morning is that we have a song to sing. Anybody have a song of praise to sing this morning? If you have a song of praise to sing, I'm going to invite you to stand just as I'm standing. And we're going to lift our voices in praise, voicing our praise this morning. You'll find the words on your left and right, projected there on the wall. Give thanks, an invitation and a proclamation. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. And that's the very reason we sing today. God, we thank You for the faithfulness, Your faithfulness. We thank You for the redemption that is ours in Jesus Christ. God, we thank You for grace that not only covers us, but surrounds us in an everyday living. And so we want to praise you this morning for your, your faithful love that is never failing for us. Unconditional love. And so the psalmist invites us, if you know the unconditional love of God this morning, we're invited to sing, sing and give thanks to the Lord. Let's lift our voices together. Give thanks with a grateful heart.
your Holy Spirit intercedes for us. Lord, it gives us the words, and this morning we thank you. We lift our hearts before you. We praise you, Lord. In this space, we invite that you find us faithful and worshiping you. And Lord, we invite that you change our hearts. Change your heart, oh God, in the song of the psalmist. And Lord, as we come this morning, our prayer is that you would change us, that you would transform us. As we lift our hearts before you and sing now, change my heart, oh God. Let it be our prayer this morning, church. God, this morning you hear the prayer of our hearts is that you indeed would change us, Lord. That you would mold us and make us anew, transform us, Lord, that we be like you. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you for this time set apart in the busyness of our life and week to acknowledge who you are. To acknowledge who you are, God, and most definitely acknowledge that we need the fullness and the wholeness of who you are, Lord in this space today as we lay ourselves before you, Lord, transparent, just as we are, Lord, we come to worship you. Would you mold us and make us, creating in us a heart that is hungry for you, a heart like you, O oh Lord, is our prayer. We thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I praise you in the name of Jesus, your Son. Let the church this morning say amen. Amen, God. Amen. You may be seated. And as you're seated this morning, I want to remind you that just as we are a praising people, we are a praying people. Anybody spent time this week in prayer? Yeah. It's often an incredible gift that we miss an opportunity to share in, and that's prayer. Prayer is things that we do at church, but I want to encourage you to know, and perhaps you spend time with the Lord in prayer, driving in your car. Anybody ever pray in your car as you're going down the street praying, Lord, hear my voice of praise. Lord, hear me. Perhaps sitting in the doctor's office or in your office or just at home in your garden. Lord, in this space, I acknowledge you and I worship you. Aren't we thankful this morning that our relationship with God is an intimate relationship, an intimate personal relationship. This morning, we as a church acknowledge that God is good. I stood on the soccer field looking at the garden boxes early this morning. I arrived really early this morning, and I was amazed at the presence of God even in that space where members of our community had already come and planted plants, and I just stood there in the awesomeness of what it means to be 
in community together. Brothers and sisters in Christ from all walks of lives and backgrounds acknowledging that this space is a gift of God. So I want to give God praise this morning for faithfulness. This morning we as well know that as we come as a church, we acknowledge in our humanness that there is brokenness, there is hurt, there is pain, there is need for prayer. If you followed this week in our prayer uh, concerns lifted in our email, you'll know that we have many among us who are in need of prayer this morning. And the true source of our hope and help is in the Lord God, Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides for us. And so this morning, we're going to spend time praising God, and we're all going to also spend time before the Lord in prayer. And so I would invite you, as I'm praying and leading prayer, that we pause, and there'll be a moment where you can praise God. I want you just there in your space to say, God, I praise you and I thank you for, and whatever that is, I would invite you to lift that before God. And we're going to pause and acknowledge that in this space, there are concerns in our hearts and lives that no one else knows about but God. They're not listed in print. They weren't given to us in an email this morning. But thanks be to God, God knows. And so we're going to pause in that prayer time, and we're going to say, God, see the deep chambers of my heart this morning. And know that I've come to this place a bit distracted because there's something in me, Lord, that's causing me fear and anxiety and anguish and worry and so God I want to commit that to you today so that I can hear the word and be transformed and so we're going to give God praise we're going to lift the concerns of our hearts before the Lord we're going to hear the good news shared we're going to break communion break bread together in the gift of communion and we're going to leave this place a blessed people amen I want to share with you a couple of prayer concerns we want to continue to pray for our sister Nancy Quarden who's having some health issues, Chad Spencer as well, who's been in the hospital this week, for our sister Noelle Baraski as she recovers from surgery, Shirley Fowles, sister-in-law Donna, we've seen those prayer concerns lifted. We continue to pray for Bob Mays as he's recovering from a knee injury, Aaron Ann Warren's brother David Smith and sister-in-law Brenda, his wife. We pray for Lori, the daughter of Ann Williams and Frank Williams. We pray for Tony Spencer's family, and I thank you for all the prayers and concerns for my family. Uh, my nephew, who was bitten by a copperhead snake, is much better. Uh, my nephew, Landon, who is suffering with brain cancer, is some better this week. So thank you all. You continually um, invite me to know by your uh, calls and telephone calls um, and conversations and emails that you're praying for my family, and I so appreciate that. This morning, amongst us, there are other concerns, I am certain. So we're going to pause now go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to give God praise. And we're also going to commit before the Lord the concerns of our hearts and lives. Let's do that now. Gracious and holy God, we come before you this morning and we are thankful. God, we are excited because you've given us an opportunity to gather in this space and acknowledge who you are. God, we gather in this space this morning acknowledging that we need you. Desperately, Lord, we need you. We're thankful, God, that in our need, our need has been met. We praise you, Lord, that you meet the needs of our hearts and lives. We thank you, Lord, that as we gather today and give in this space to praise you, Lord, you hear the praises of your people. We praise you, God, for your mighty works. We praise you for the wonderful deeds that we acknowledge. We praise you, Lord, for your limitless love and wisdom. We praise you this morning for your grace that is overwhelming. God, we praise you and thank you this morning that we have seen you at work in our lives, in our church, in our community. Lord, we lift before you now the praises of our hearts and lives. Praise you, Jesus. God, hear the praises of your people now. God, we acknowledge as well as we praise you that we are broken. And we are in desperate need of you. Everything we need, God, is found in you. For those of us who've come this morning feeling broken, we pray for restoration. For those of us who've come this morning feeling weak, God, we pray for strength. For those of us who come weeping, God, we invite that you fill us with joy. For those of us this morning, God, who come with doubt, we invite that you fill us with faith. For those of us who come feeling shame, we invite that you, God, give us the gift of freedom in Jesus' name. 
for those of us who come feeling burdened, God, that you would give to our souls rest. For those of us who come this morning feeling anxious, God, we pray that we, you would give us the gift of your peace. We submit to you now, Lord, the prayer concerns of our hearts and lives. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, you are faithful. You are good. Everything we need, oh God, is found in you, and for that we are thankful. God of wind and God of flame, we invite that you stir our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit, that your Spirit move freely on Pentecost through the church. God, you transformed hearts to know you fully. Help us to be open to the same Spirit this day so that we might experience transformation. Guide us in this transforming love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. And let the church of God this morning say amen. Amen.
Amen. Grace and peace to you, Beulah Church. My name is Pastor John. I'm so glad to be able to be with you today to worship together in person, to see so many faces, and to join together online in worship as well. I'm reminded today as I look at my calendar uh, that, including today, I have only four Sundays left with you all at Beulah, and I say that not as a countdown, but as a celebration of all that God has done and all that God is doing and the joy and privilege it is to continue to worship with you all throughout the month of June. So we celebrate that, and I am grateful and offer uh, prayer and praise for that as well. This morning, as we continue in worship, I invite you to hear the words uh, from the Old Testament, from the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verses 10 through 20. Let's give attention to the reading of God's Word. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. Still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flock, and you yourselves will become slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all other nations. For a king, with a king to lead us, and to go out before us, and to fight our battles. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in a brief prayer so we continue to meditate on God's word. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In our scripture today, what we hear first and foremost is that the people of Israel, specifically the elders of Israel, they ask Samuel to give them a king. And you might find this to be kind of strange and wonder, and to provide a little bit of context as to why this is happening, you need to know that this is in the time of the judges. The time of the judges is this period when the people of Israel, that they have formed, become a nation, they've been freed from oppression in Egypt, they've wandered through the wilderness, and finally, they're in the land of Canaan. They're in their homeland, their promised land, and what they have as ruler and leadership is they have judges. These judges are called and designed by God to remind the people of God's commandments, God's laws, and to remind them of their specific calling as God's people. This is kind of the structure and the formation of who they are. And one of the things that we hear that the judges do is they help them to avoid idolatry as they come into contact with people of other nations and backgrounds. But what we hear throughout the book of Judges prior to our scripture today is that the time of the judges was a lawless time. It was a time of much unfaithfulness. In fact, what we hear in the final verse of the book of Judges is this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. This was a time of great calamity and pain for the people of Israel. They did what was right in their own eyes, meaning they had their own moral compass and guide that they did not listen to God. They did not listen to the judges and many horrible things happened to God's people, and that they did to one another. Then along comes Samuel, who is a righteous judge who helps God's people get back onto the way to follow God's will, follow God's commandments. And then there's this cry for a king. Now for us, if we understand this time of judges and this sort of loose governance and organization the people of Israel had, we might th say to ourselves, a king makes sense. A king would give them stability as they're trying to navigate what it means to be a kingdom, what it means to be a, a people united in God. 
They might say, oh, that could provide us clarity. Instead of hearing from a judge who might not be respected, we can hear from our king, our, our, our leader who God has chosen. And this might offer us clarity as well about who we are, united in one body as the people of Israel. But we don't hear any of those reasons as to why they want a king. None of the obvious reasons to us. No, nothing of the sort. What we hear is that Samuel has become old. His sons are now judges, and they're not doing a very good job. In fact, in the beginning of this scripture story, we hear that they are, his sons are taking bribes. They're profiting from their position and their leadership as God's chosen people to lead and be guided. And they are no longer upholding justice, but they're perverting justice by using their position and power to gain for themselves. What we hear from the people, these elders of Israel, is that they want a king because they want to be like other nations. They're looking around at the other kingdoms around them and saying, Ooh, they've got a king. We want to be just like them. We want a king who's going to fight our battles, who's going to go to war, and we want a king to, to govern and to lead us. But here in this moment that we hear in our scripture story is ultimately the failure of Israel, or at least the failure of those elders who are clamoring for a king. Because the major theme throughout the Old Testament that is incredibly clear that, that God lays out through all of Scripture is that Israel are the chosen people of God. That when God called and blessed Abraham, that was a sign and a covenant and a promise. And, and there were many covenants and promises made to Abraham's descendants and the people they were in oppression in Egypt and God freed them and God remained faithful to those promises and said, you will be set apart. As they wandered through the wilderness, they had laws and commands to say, you are God's people. So much so that in, in fact, all of God's commands made them live a different way. That God told them to take a Sabbath, to have a day specifically of rest, a day of worship and connection with God. God's commands told them how they should dress, what they should wear, what they should eat, how they should uh, use their money and, and have debt and forgive people of debt, and how they should treat others, how they should love their neighbor, and how they should be in connection and community together. And all of these commands were designed to set the people apart so that God's glory could be shown. So that it would be evident that God was at work in these people, that they were living a way that looked different from the rest of the world. Israel knows they have been chosen as God's set-apart people, yet they clamor for a king. They call for a king so they can be just like everyone else. Samuel, who is a faithful leader, he is distraught by this, upset by this, and he goes before the Lord to say, this is what the people are, are asking for, what they're, what they're saying, and, and the Lord consoles Samuel and says, they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. This is the truth of the matter, is that they've not burden. We want to eat just like other people. We want to not rest like other people. We want to wear whatever clothes other people want to wear. What they're doing is they're, they're giving up this calling. They're giving up their, their blessing and, and their purpose in life. And we see that this is the root problem throughout the story of the Old Testament and even our story as well. Samuel, as we know, he's upset by, this, by the response of God's people, by the leaders, by the elders. And he thinks it's a personal attack by the way we, we hear that God consoles him and says, hey, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me. But what happens in the correspondence between God and Samuel is that God says, warn the people. Warn the people about what a king means. We heard that in our scripture today, that Samuel warns them that a king means that a king will take away all your sons. Your sons, they will go and they will serve in those wars that you want to fight. And they will be on the front line and they will be the first to die. Your other sons, they will serve as leaders and officers in the army and, and they may die as well. 
Your other sons who don't go to war, guess what? They're going to work in the fields. They're going to produce food for the king and for all his officers, and others are going to be craftsmen who build weapons of war. But your daughters are not safe either. Your daughters will be taken. They will be used to serve the king in his palace. They will have various roles and responsibilities. And not only are your children not safe, but all your wealth and your ownership are taken as well. The best of your land, the best of your livestock, one-tenth of all your produce, even your slaves and servants will be taken in service of the kingdom. This is a heavy sacrifice to ask for a king to, to give up their special calling, so much so that Samuel says, you will be the king's slaves. That you will no longer be free, but you will be slaves to the king. You will serve his every beck and call. And Bruce Birch, theologian, he says this, to serve a king is to return to bondage. To reverse what God had done in the Exodus deliverance from Egypt. This is what's so critical in this story. Is that the, the foundational story for centuries, even today for the people of Israel, is that God freed them from a tyrant, from Pharaoh, from an oppressive regime who punished them, who treated them as slaves in Egypt in a foreign land that was not their own. God freed them and delivered them. We know those stories. Many of us know those stories well about plagues and about how God led those people out from that situation, parted the water so that they could walk freely to their destination. This was the defining story, and yet they're saying here, God, we'd rather go back, but we want to choose our own king. We want to be enslaved again. We want to be in bondage again. We no longer want you to be our king. As we look with hindsight at Israel's history, we can see that things did not turn out well for them. Though there would be some good kings, there were many kings who did not follow God, did not follow God's commands, did not honor God, that eventually the kingdom would split in two into a northern and a southern kingdom because they were not united in God. Eventually, all the people of Israel would be exiled, no longer claiming their land as their home and as their own. They would be exiled away, and the temple that they built to honor God would be destroyed. Essentially, they will have lost everything because they said, God, give us a king. Give us someone to rule over us. This began when they rejected God as their king. Today, as a church, there's many lessons for us to glean from this story, the primary one of which is this. Rejecting God, rejecting God's plan, will lead to our downfall, will lead to our failure. When it comes to being the church, we have the example of Jesus Christ to show us what it means to follow and to love God. And one of the simple ways that we know what Jesus calls us to do is in his final words in the Great Commission to his disciples, he tells them to go, baptize, and teach. To go and serve, to baptize people new to the faith, and to teach people so that they can be disciples who create disciples. Three simple steps for us to the church. But unfortunately, we as a church, over the centuries, we often make this way more complicated than it needs to be. We get caught up in things outside of going, baptizing, and teaching. That, in fact, nowhere in Scripture does it say, God, we should, we should build buildings, or we should have pastors for our churches. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that those are required for us to be church, that if we don't have those things, that we won't be church and over this last year of pandemic, we've realized a lot of the things that we've said, this is church, we didn't need to actually be the church. What we need is Jesus as our king to be the church, to have that to be our focal, our, our ideal. And what we also need is not just Jesus to be our king, but we need as the body to come together. Martin Luther, he started the Protestant Reformation, and he had this idea of the priesthood of all believers. Martin Luther, he was a, a Catholic priest who sought to reform the church, but what he, when he sought to reform it, one of the reasons he was reforming the Catholic church is he saw that the priests had too much power, that they were manipulating that, abusing that, and the people did not have any sort of authority. They didn't know who God was, but it only came through the priests. 
So what Martin Luther said is that we are called, all of us, to be priests, all of us to serve and to be anointed by God to go and to serve. And yet what we've seen throughout the centuries, whether priests or pastors, as many times as the church we've said, pastor, you're our king. We no longer need God. Pastor, you're our king, you're our, our personality, you're our identity. Even as the Methodist movement, John Wesley started this movement out of the Church of England because he saw much of corruption there that, and that many people were not being reached by, by the pastors and leaders of the day. And what he sought to do was to create small group type ministries, groups of about 12 people to come together to be accountable, to grow, to go, to serve, and to teach, to meet the needs of others. And this movement spread quickly throughout England. It spread quickly throughout America. There were people known as circuit riders who would get on horses, and they would go to communities, and they would, they would help people understand this vision, and the people would build this. Circuit riders would, would go, but the people would build this. But today, in our churches, in our Methodist churches, and in many Protestant churches, it takes just as much training to become an ordained pastor as it does to become a medical doctor. It takes just as much time for this training. And many of us has, have said, no, you're the one with education. You're the one with authority. You're our king. Guide us and lead us. We treat pastors as CEOs. These chief executives who make every decision, every guidance, say, you know best. You're the one who's in control. We don't care. And many churches, if you ask them, oh, what's your church like? They'll say, oh, well, you got to meet our pastor you got to meet our pastor. Our pastor's funny. Our pastor's smart. Our pastor's educated. Our pastor serves. And yet we never say what God is doing in our midst. We point to a person. We point to a king instead of pointing to Jesus Christ himself. This is when we fail as the church to recognize our calling and to recognize our vision should be on Jesus because God never called Israel to be a kingdom with many kings and with many palaces and with great authority and respect among the nations. No, God called them simply to be faithful. To be faithful. And church, the flip side to our failure as the people of Israel or as the church is that when we thrive, and we thrive when we're faithful to God's calling. We thrive in the midst of of being faithful to who God has called us to be. And I know from the stories of this church that God has been faithful to Beulah and that you have been faithful to responding to God. That this church had started in a brush arbor and this church didn't grow because there was an incredible pastor who just gave the best sermons ever and was the best pastor in all of Virginia. No, this church grew because of the people, because the people caught God's vision and grew from it. When this building was built that we're in today and, and the subsequent buildings around, it wasn't just a pastor who said, hey, this is a good idea. This is what we need to do. It was people like you who knew the vision, who caught the vision, who sacrificed greatly of your time to live into that vision and to offer your finances so that the, God's kingdom could be expanded and so God's calling could be expanded in this community. We thrive when we are unified in our vision of God's calling for us. And recently, you'll know that we had a town hall, and we discussed this on Beulah Day a few weeks ago, that as we've been praying over throughout the, the pandemic, that one of the three ways that we see God calling us to focus our, our vision forward on God's calling is to focus on worship, discipleship, and outreach. In many ways, our own way of understanding how Jesus has called us to go, baptize, and teach. And if we're faithful to this, and as we continue to seek what God's vision is, God will allow us to thrive. So how do we come to these conclusions? How do we move forward out of this pandemic? And how do we people who thrive that focus our vision on Christ as King? Well, first, it requires us to listen. To thrive requires us to listen, to discern what is God's will, what is God saying. We have the scriptures to guide us, to point us to what God is saying, to the example of Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit who's actively living and breathing in our lives to show us and guide us on our path. Unfortunately, many times we become distracted by this. We say, oh, wh whatever is good, we lose sight and we become busy and we just look at the other church down the road and say they're doing this, so we must do this as well. And we ignore God's specific vision for us as a church. 
and God's vision for us, it's both individual and collective, that God has a unique purpose and calling for every single one of us, a plan and purpose for every single one of us, and also united as the church. We realize this through prayer and reflection. That's one of the ways that we listen. And then we create space in that reflection to listen to what God is actually saying to us. Because God often prepares us for our callings through prayer and through reflection. God prepares our hearts, changes our hearts to know what is next. The second thing we've got to do after listening is we've got to dialogue. We need to dialogue with God and with others. When we dialogue, it means we, we've not only heard what God has said, but then we, we talk amongst each other. We talk to God and say, is this really what you want us to do, God? Is this really what you would have me do? And then we come together as the church and say, God, we think this is the, the vision that you've placed on us, so we must talk about it. We must discern this together, and we have to take steps forward. Now, the challenge is that sometimes God tells us different things which can create conflict. There can be different steps and actions to say what we need to do moving forward. We see this in the story of the people of Israel, that Samuel had a vision of what God was saying, and the people had an entirely different vision. And as your pastor, at times I felt this too, saying, God, I don't know if this is the way forward. I don't know if this is the way we should go. The people are saying something else. But it takes us coming together in dialogue, listening and praying to discern what God is doing in our midst And when we dialogue, we come together and a vision is established. A vision is made clear. The truth of the matter is that there's two responses to a vision being established. One is that some people won't support it. They will say, I'm not interested in that. I don't care about that. I don't have enough time or energy for that. And some people might even leave the church because they don't believe in the vision. And that's okay. Because we want to bless people to grow wherever God is leading them in that vision. But the second thing is that people are inspired. When a vision is established, people are inspired because they say, for the first time in my life, I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what God's calling is. I know what God wants me to do. I know who I am. I'm sure you can think in your own life moments when you've experienced that clarity, that calling, And you as a church have experienced this calling when we've got behind an idea to say, yes, this is what God is calling us to do. The third thing in order to do to thrive is we must find our role. That for each of us, not only has God placed a calling on our lives, but we have a unique role and responsibility to step up into that calling. That thriving means that a vision becomes a lived reality. That it's great to have visions But if we say, hey, that's a wonderful vision, we love that idea, that's great. But if nothing happens, then the vision falters, and the vision collapses, then it's no good, but we must step forward, we must respond to God's calling, both individually and collectively, for that vision to really thrive. So how does your life fit into God's vision? Take time to pray reflect on what that is and how is God calling you in this place to to serve? How is God calling you to use your unique gifts so that all might experience the transformation of the Holy Spirit? The invitation today is that we are called to live into God's calling. We're to live into God's purpose for us individually and collectively. We do this. We accept this invitation when we listen when we dialogue, and when we find our role. Together, we can create disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Together, we can change our own lives. We can change our community. We can change our church, and we might even be able to change the world. Would you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to respond to your grace and to your goodness. God, we give you thanks for the reminder that you have called us to be the king, that you have called us as your king, and that, God, we seek you, not our ways, not other kings, not other people, but, God, simply you. Help us to grow into our identity in you, and may we be faithful in your calling. And, God, may we experience your presence and your power today and the gift of yourself poured out in communion. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Today we come together to gather 
for communion. You should have received a communion cup on your way in. If you did not, if you just raise your hand and one of the ushers at the back will make sure that you get one. But go ahead and get those out now. Hold on to that. Don't consume the elements quite yet. Uh, we need, uh, David Dudley, we need one over here on the right side, and we need one back over here on the left side too. So if you just keep your hand raised up if you need one so the ushers can see you and get those communion elements. Go, feel free to get them out at this time, but don't consume them quite yet. Uh, we'll consume them all together at the conclusion of the great Thanksgiving service. We are reminded on this incredible day, a gift of God, that Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we, we have, have not, not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We, we have, have failed, failed to be an obedient church. church. We, we have, have not done your will. will. We have, we have broken, broken your law. law. We, we have, have rebelled against your love. love. We have not, not loved our neighbors. neighbors. And we, we have, have not heard, heard the cry of the needy. Of the needy. Forgive, Forgive us, us, we pray. Free, free us for joyful obedience. obedience. Through, Through Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. I invite you to hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the, In the name of, of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so, with your people on earth, and with all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the, in the name of the Lord. Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that time had come that you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves and praise and thanksgiving as a living sacrifice to you. In union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim now the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until we come and feast at your heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours now, Almighty God, now and forever. 
Amen. And we continue to praise God and offer our prayers by joining in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning as we come together to take communion, you should have a, a communion cup before you. There's some light plastic on top. I invite you to get out uh, your, your wafer first and then to take both elements together with the juice. I invite you now to know that this is the body and blood of Christ broken and given to you. Now let us take and eat and see that the Lord is good. Amen. In response to God's goodness and faithfulness today, we're going to close out our service with a hymn, being reminded where our hope and trust comes from today, recognizing that our hope comes from Jesus Christ. So as you are able, I invite you to stand and sing together, My Hope is Built for our closing hymn today. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. When darkness fills his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet call, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand, all of the ground is sinking sand. Amen. Today, as you go from this place, a couple reminders before you receive the benediction. One, we have uh, baskets at the back exits for you to uh, respond to God today if you wish to offer um, offering today and tithe today. You can also do that online on the church website. But I invite you now to go and receive this blessing before you. Go now, knowing that Jesus Christ is King. Go to go baptize and teach in Christ's name. Amen.